Cheers. Okay. All right. Look for a hand. There's an empty seat there. I know you want to hang with your friends, but we're all friends here besides Rochester. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. Okay. I hope that works out, right? That's cool, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Oh, do you have that anymore? I have no idea what that is. Uh, I can't see my slides, right? That's okay. I'll just go like this. Oh, you can't see your I can see him. Oh, no, I can see him here. I can see him here. Let's go like this. I'm going to do quick okay. announcements, and then we'll be here again. Yeah. Are you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do your thing. Whoa. Whoa, we're streaming. Uh... So, in uh, perfect B-Size Rock fashion, we will be randomly streaming this. We just decided this two seconds ago. Uh, we will be streaming this talk right now in track two. So, if you can't fit in this room, you can go to track two. Um, it'll be much. It's not as cool as being in this room. I'm not saying leave, but if you can't fit and you don't want to be standing up back there, then please go to track two. Okay. Um, before we begin, a couple announcements. Right after this, there's going to be a food truck. Uh, one food truck. That's going to be right outside the building. Um, everybody's going to be going there. There's going to be a line. I'm sorry. That's just how that's going to work. If you don't want to stand in line, there's other areas around RIT that you can go get food. Uh, feel free to. Uh, there's all, you know, all places around campus. Uh, there's a one-hour block in our schedule for food and coming back at like 1 p.m. And you should be ready to go. So, you good, Mika? Yeah. Yeah. I'm open, but... What's not? It's not streaming? You're, you're good to go. I'm good to go. Yeah. As long as it's recording. It's recording, yeah. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah. So, cool. So, uh, I want to introduce our keynote. Uh, Matt Mitchell is somebody that uh, I met years ago, I think, yeah. at uh, some OTF stuff in Spain, maybe. Um, and he's a guy that I just like his perspective on InfoSec. It's not, I went to school and I did InfoSec and here's the things that I'm supposed to learn. He has like more applied knowledge and some of this stuff and has seen some different things. So I'm really excited for him to be here. Please give him a round of applause, Matt Mitchell. Thank you for being here, Rochester. Woo! Okay. All right. Well, I was here in the morning announcements, and people were still waking up, but we had a whole bunch of amazing sessions, so I want you to like stretch out. This is a one-hour talk. I'm going to try to squeeze it in so we can do some Q&A, maybe. Does that sound cool? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm from Harlem in New York City, and People are really vocal there, so I need you to, you know, a little bit louder. So, does that sound great? Yeah! Okay, okay, yeah, okay, let's do it. Yeah, no worries. Oh, that goes under. Yeah, do your thing. How's that? You guys just might come in. Sorry. All right, whatever. Okay, you, can, you can sit and do whatever you guys do. Okay, next slide. Um, well, okay, I'm Matt, and um, I'm known for this project that I do called Crypto Harlem, but I do a lot of other things, and we're going to jump into that as well. Uh, this is my Twitter. I'm, I need followers. I'm still an egg. I still need some followers, so follow me on Twitter. That's my um, GPG key if you want to send me an encrypted email. C complain about this talk. No worries. I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to decrypt and read and encrypt and send it out to you. Um, and this talk will be posted via Twitter, it's Creative Commons, so you can catch it later, but just give me a minute, a couple days to get it up. Okay, so um, who am I? I'm a hacker, but I work uh, for the benefit of civil society, nonprofits, NGOs, dissidents, journalists, and human rights defenders. That's what I do, and that's all I do. I don't do it in my spare time, I don't do it nights and weekends, it's my full-time job. When I meet young folks who are studying information security, studying cyber, studying application security, hacking, always at those events and always in those universities, I'll see people from uh, government sector, private security sector, but I don't normally see these groups represented. 
And there's a lucrative path there if you're interested. These groups need you just as well. We always talk about how there's tons of jobs in InfoSec and not enough people. But not all the jobs are in one place. And that's what my talk's about and some of uh, the applied kind of practical security knowledge that I've gotten from, from doing this work for many years. So uh, let's dive in. How's it sound? Right? Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. I was like, all right. I heard about Rochester. I heard it'd be like that energy, right? So let's bring it, like Niagara Falls style. All right? Okay. Okay, so one of the things that I'm really passionate about is being an ally for marginalized groups, underrepresented groups. You know, um, when I was a kid, I was really into punk rock. I was really into Riot Girl. And there was this thing, like, where a band would come on stage, and they'd be like, girls to the front. And they were like, look, dudes, step back 20 paces. This isn't for you. And uh, I like that, you know, because this field of computer science was developed and, and worked on and pushed forward by women. And then all of a sudden, if you watch this, um, if you ever check out this Planet Money recording, it's a great little podcast, uh, all of a sudden the numbers just took a nosedive and they've, they've stayed really low. So um, if, if you're someone there in the, the audience who self-identifies as a woman, this talk's for you, it's dedicated to you. If you're from an underrepresented group, you're a marginalized group, um, whether it's one that's like obvious, like you're a dude from Harlem, right? Or whether it's one that, you know, maybe you have a, a learning disability, maybe you're on the spectrum, maybe, you know, you're queer, maybe it's not so visible, this talks for you too, all right? All right. Come on. How can you not put your hands together for that? Okay, let's go. Uh, I was walking through the hallways yesterday after this really amazing Capture the Flag uh, class. It was very high quality. I only took like an hour, but just stuck my head in. But anyone who got to go to that, you're going to be grabbing some flags and CTFs all over the place. So you're, they, it was very, very good. Um, and I passed by the sign that said um, women in computing at RIT. And I, uh, uh, sorry, and I stuck my head in and I met this group there, women in computing, that has a mailing list of like 300 some odd people and has an active membership of like 70 something people on a, on a really good day. And I thought it was really amazing that that's available here. So if you want to see these numbers change and you know want to see things better, uh, more people in this field, definitely represent and, and raise up the work of this, this club, this organization, this group, and definitely ask them if there's anything you can do. So I thought it was great and I just wanted to have a piece of my slides uh, for something local, okay. All right, so I'm the founder of this event called Crypto Harlem. And uh, Crypto Harlem is an event where I, in my neighborhood, talk to people about surveillance. We know that surveillance is not metered out evenly. And regardless on your viewpoints on it, some folks are more surveilled than other folks. It's just the way that it is. So if you're seen as a suspicious other, then you're gonna face surveillance more in your existence and life than other people. And uh, in the inner city, there just happens to be a lot of folks who are going to be surveilled. So I thought, let me just do this three-hour office hours. I was like, look, I'm a hacker. I don't know if anyone wants to go to this thing. And uh, over five years, it's grown to be quite successful. I have it at this little community center space uh, on the street there on Malcolm X Boulevard in Harlem in Manhattan. Uh, it's a predominantly African-American neighborhood. And, um, you know... The reception has been really huge. Uh, we've gotten a lot of, um, almost too huge. Where there's, I've always decided that I want to keep it small. I've always decided that I wanted to make it part of the community. So some, I, we do it once a month, and sometimes I just turn people away. I'm just like, come back next month, we're full. Right? Uh, or some people will just show up because they're working folks, and they'll show up and just grab 30 minutes of knowledge and then leave, and someone will take their seat. And, uh, but is anyone interested to see what it might look like, the event itself? All right. Okay. Thanks. Let's see how you. I'm gonna check in 45 minutes into this talk. I want that energy to be out. Okay. Okay. So this should work, hopefully. Okay. Let's hit that. Mm, not. Is it working? Yeah. Is it working? Oh, wait. Can you hear? It? Is there sound? Uh oh. Okay, hold on. Yeah, old school. Hold on. <laughs> Solve your own problems. I don't know if that's going to mess up the uh, the streamy thing, but... 
I can unplug the audio jack. I'm allowed to. I'm allowed to do stuff. My laptop is. I think I am pumping it out through the HDMI. All right, so there's nothing we can do, right? I can change my audio output. Okay, uh, could you give me uh, like two minutes of your time to change my audio output? Is that cool? Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Maybe. So if you uh, hop back up to your desktop, mm -hmm. right click on your um, thingy here. No, no, go to the. Uh, if you go yeah, click on the desktop, click yeah. on the little arrow up. Yep. And then right click on your audio. Mm -hmm. And then do recording. Or sorry, playback devices. Mm -hmm. And now, if you have. Uh, if you plug in the aux cable again. Yes. And then you right click on that and set that as default. The, the speaker. Right click on that. Set as default. Yep. And do test. Test. Do you hear anything? No. Okay. Um, test. Whoa! Whoa! Put your hands together for this gentleman right here. Amazing. Amazing. Normal conference. That would have been over. <laughs> Besides Rochester, we just keep on going. Okay. So who wants to see what that event looks like in Harlem? Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Okay, let's see if I can get this now. Okay, I think I got it. Uh, do I know how to use a computer? No. When I talk to you about surveillance, there's this kind of like, why well, I don't have anything to hide. I never get that when I'm talking to this community. You can't buy a bag of chips in Harlem without being surveilled. A crypto party is an event where people get together to talk about digital surveillance, digital safety, and what they can do to um, be safe or mitigate risk. Crypto Harlem is open for all people. All people are welcome. But Crypto Harlem is here for a reason. It's for black people in Harlem who are over-policed and uh, heavily surveilled. And this is a safe space for us all to learn together and want something to learn from each other. Harlem is like a cultural hub. It's really important to highlight it, like where it's been and where it's going. Including tech in that conversation is just important about making sure that we can progress. Like it's about disruption. One thing that I do is I spend a lot of time looking at current events in information security, cyber, and I ask myself, like, how does this story affect people on the ground in Harlem right now? So I'll walk around for three hours, just handing out flyers, talking to people in the community, promoting the event, um, because, you know, you're not going to get the best people and a, a good representation of the community by posting it on Meetup or, or Twitter. That's just not reality. You need to go to the barber shops. You need to go to the hair salons. You need to talk to the pastor of that church and the imam of that mosque and really get down with the people. Uh, can I give you this? It's a free class that we do right down around the corner over there. Yeah. It's about computer security. It's like family friendly. It talks about surveillance and a lot of other issues. In New York City, especially in communities like Bronx and Harlem, we have this thing called stop and frisk. It's like very aggressive and it's dehumanizing. But there's a new practice, which is like the digital version of it, which is probably more dangerous. What we see with this kind of digital world of stop and frisk are young folks who are told by YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, be yourself, express yourself, tell us your stories and present them here. And those stories are being turned against them. If there is any criminal act or an act of violence by one person, and that person's associated with you or associated with your crew, you'll get taken down. A lot of people understand this idea of like six degrees of separation, but when you're a person of color, it's like two. These kind of stories, we need to pick them up, we need to raise them up, we need to address them and solve them ourselves because no one else will. If you can hear the sound of my voice, right, clap your hands three times. Okay, we're starting back. Black folks have been surveilled since the very beginning, since we landed here on slave ships, right? So um, you're a number. They're just like slave number 10, walked over here, walked over there, drank some water, did this. That situation has followed us, but hasn't changed that much. Technology will just make things harder to see. 
So what Matt does with these crypto parties is he'll bring he'll bring a different topic each time he comes in. It's about exposing them to a lot of pe different pieces of information, but it's also about equipping you with that knowledge and then moving forward on your own. Well, when we have these surveillance talks, I tend to see morality going down. And I would like to see morality going up. So if we can share more tools that organizers should be using today, even if you can name one or two, I would love to know. I think he does a really good job of then trying to encourage you to take control of whether it's your privacy or it's learning about blockchain or it's learning about Bitcoin. Like he really tries to empower people. Shut up, Tommy, yo. Thank you. Okay. What about at a, a protest? So New York City was like, we're going to try to set up the rules where we'll turn off the cameras at a protest so you're not being you know, shown like, okay, I'm this person, I'm against this thing. But the cameras are moving faster than the regulations are because law doesn't move that quickly. I think that it's for us as citizens to get a little more involved in these policies and issues so we can help steer them. People are hungry for this. And there's so many community leaders who are already here. And coming into a room like this just kind of gives you an affirmation. Like, yes, we're on the right path. I'm a hacker, but I'm black first. And when you see me a block away, you know I'm black. You don't know I'm a hacker. One thing that I hope to get out of this event is creating more black hackers, creating more black people in cyber, creating more black people in infosec, because it's a space where there are more positions than people. So I want to see more of myself in the, in the work that I, I work in. People say this is the next frontier of civil rights. And it's a statement that I agree with. Done. Five minutes. Okay. Mm. okay. I was on Mr. Robot. I didn't even know. I was watching Mr. Robot the last season. And then Elliot picks up his phone. And it's, it's supposed to, like in that show, it's quite a few years ago. So it's the old version of Signal where it had this still confirmation. And look at the words there. Crypto Harlem. That's my event. Whoa. And then there was a then there was a scene where Elliot like runs into a data center, right? And he's like him and Mr. Robot are like fighting it out. He's losing consciousness constantly. And he sits down at a terminal and it says contact Matt Mitchell. That's me. <laughs> Whoa. How weird is that? Free advertising. Free advertising. Yeah. Too bad I don't make any money out of this, but yeah, I know. <laughs> it's okay. It's cool. I, I do it for I do it for the people. I do it for the lulls. Okay. So um, another thing that I do, though, because, you know, doing a community event is great, but it doesn't buy you gold boots. So <laughs> I'm wearing gold boots. You can't tell. Um, so what I do is I work as uh, independent operational and information security trainer for a group called GJS Security. I'm a subcontractor. I work for a lot of different groups, but most of my time is spent with these folks. And uh, they're a hostile environment, emergency first aid training uh, group that's called HEFAT. And uh, the way that they do their hostile environment training is one that simulates a real world environment. And I think that's really important, and I'll, I'll loop back to this again. But when we're working with journalists who are about to go to uh, a conflict zone, like Syria, or they're about to go to where there's um, a hurricane, like Hurricane Maria and going to Puerto Rico. They need to be certified in how to be OK so they can tell the story. And the news organization that they work with sends them to these HEFAT trainings by groups like GJS. And uh, the way that GJS does it is when you show up at the farm, that's one of their facilities, it looks like what you're about to experience. Because you need to know what you're going to do when you hear that gunshot sound. You need to know what you're going to do when the wind and the rain are blowing at you and you're freezing cold. And you don't really know, because it's hardwired. you got to bring yourself there in a comfortable way. Because you don't want to find out when it's the most important time that you freeze. You don't want to find out the most important time that, that you run, or that you're going to just lock up and wet your pants. You want to know in a safe environment when we're going to be there. Um, and then we can take you from where you are to what will get you through. And I do the digital side of this. So it's one thing to tell someone, you should encrypt your email, because this thing could happen, some anecdotal story. 
you should use signal because this could happen something, right? It's another thing when you're actually seeing it happen. And it takes someone with a certain skill set to make that simulation ring true. And that's what I do. I'm gonna talk more about the difference between what we learn in our courses, in our training, in our university setting, and the reality on the ground. Okay, cool. Another thing I do is um, I do digital safety and security coaching for a group called the Movement for Black Lives, which is an umbrella group of like 60 organizations. Some of them are very well known, like Black Lives Matter. Some of them are not that well known, like Black Youth Project 100. Um, and for them, they're organizers who are working inside the United States. And for a lot of the people who are organizing, whether you're in a labor movement or a feminist movement or civil rights, racial justice movement, strangely enough, your adversary, we talk about threat models, are things like you know, your FBI or Department of Homeland Security or things like that. You know, if, you're, if you're working with um, sex workers right, if, uh, against this FOSTA um, um, act, right? if you're working with, right? Nobody? Okay, never mind. Look it up. EFF, look it up. Okay. Um, if you're working with undocumented folks, right? If you're working with anyone who's marginalized, their adversaries are going to touch upon things that aren't normally adversaries to you. And it's very sophisticated. And to properly be able to defend folks, you've got to completely change the way that you work and up your game. Okay. So who is this person that you're listening to? Uh, I was a 2016-2017 Mozilla Ford Open Web Fellow. Uh, Mozilla had this program with Ford Foundation, which is a big civil society funding group. You might have watched the documentary and it's paid for by Ford Foundation. And that money came from uh, Henry Ford, who made like the first car, American car, his brother. Right? Um, they paid for me to work with a group called Color of Change, which is a modern civil rights organization. And I did organizational security for them. Because an organization cannot install signal. It does not have hands, right? So how do you secure an organization? How do you do that? How do you get them to a place where um, they are looking at a different type of positioning and footing for the threats that come in every day? That's something that I tackled and I created a, a framework out of. Um, I was a 2016, 2017 Internet Freedom Festival fellow and uh, IFF is an uh, amazing uh, conference that's free to attend that happens in Valencia, Spain every year. And it's a, the, I think like this past IFF, just a couple of months ago, or maybe it was even one month ago, well, um, the past IFF was represented by 60, almost like 65% global south. So that's people from India, Africa, the developing world. People in countries that are growing so quickly with leadership that's a little bit unsure of technology, making rules and laws that we could never imagine happening here. In a place where maybe, uh, you know, you can have a GPG, but you have to give your passphrase to law enforcement or security forces if they ask for it. That is the law on the books, right? Or where encryption itself is illegal, but you can still shop on Amazon. Some reason they let that SSL encryption happen, but they won't let you encrypt a USB drive. So when you're dealing with those problems, they're harder to solve. You can't just say, hey, use this tool, when the tool you recommend might be breaking the law. Right? So it's important to go to events like this, for me, to talk to real people who are doing really basic things on the ground, just trying to uh, like fight against CCTV cameras or uh, strange changes in laws and fake news and things like this. I was a 2016 to 2017 New America Cybersecurity Initiative fellow. And New America is a DC-based think tank, and they think about what the future will look like, and they're very invested in cyber. I always can tell what kind of hacker or what kind of information security or what kind of tech person you are when you do the work that we all do, that we all study, that we're passionate about, by how you even refer to it. If you say cyber, then I get it. I know where you're coming from, right? And uh, it was great. I really enjoyed this because in my fellowship, I got to meet people who, um, you know, wear military outfits with like, you know, pins and stars on them, and that's their interaction with cyber, right? Uh, that's their interaction with this work. And I got to talk to them from like, hey, what about this vantage point? And we kind of learned together. Whoa, hold on, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, so um, 
I am, uh, I was a 2017 Institute for the Future, Future of Good fellow. Let's see if we can keep this alive. And um, that is a, another think tank that's based in Palo Alto, which is like Silicon Valley. And uh, it was interesting there. We were looking at the future of governance and what will government and governance look like in the future. And strangely enough, we just happened to stumble into this year where Brexit changes in uh, leadership in the United States, in Western Europe, and across the world were happening. So I, uh, this is like a, I'm, I'm not dropping any O-days, but I am going to tell you a new title, is I'm the security lead for a group called the Tactical uh, Technology Collective. And they're based out of um, Berlin. They're an, an Amsterdam NGO, non-governmental organization. And I assist them with their information security, with their curriculum and training and with how they keep their trainers safe when they travel to help people in different parts of the world. Because that's something that I specialize in. Not just being great where I stand, but trying to apply that in a condition that is so different than what you can imagine. I'm an advisor to the Open Technology Fund, and um, OTF are the people that fund a lot of the open source and free tools that we use every day. Whether that's Mailvelope, whether that's Signal, um, Open Whisper wouldn't have signal, wouldn't have that initial funding without OTF. And um, there are a lot of people here, including Mark, who works with OTF and does great things and helps, helps that program. Um, and I'm an advisor to Internet Freedom Festival that's in Valencia. I went to it so many times, I was like, this is so important to me. I want to make sure that I lend my skills to keeping them safe and also staring at it a little bit to keep that magic special. And I used to be um, a developer in data journals at the New York Times. That was my last like, full-time, nine-to-five type gig. OK, so information security. Information security, to me, is just keeping our data safe. We have information. We want to keep it secure, whether that's encrypting it, whether that's obfuscating it, whether that's like you know, stenography, whatever it is. It's just keeping your information safe. And there's so many ways to do it, and but it's basically tools, software, computer science, cryptography at its core. Operational security is the tradecraft behind it, and that's completely different. Every tool that we use, the flaw is ourselves. We don't necessarily understand how this can be used. Uh, um, the, like I was actually talking to uh, Jessica about the footprints that we leave. And to be a really good student of operational security is to understand how to properly keep your information secure. Not the tool to use, but how to use that tool. And that is a lesson that you can best find by researching scraps of information. Not just how human rights defenders uh, get caught, but also how like really horrible bad people get caught too. We have to open up our minds to both sides of this. Because once we, uh, we understand that, then we understand, like, OK, so if these parameters work to catch a bad person, they could also work for a nation state to catch a, a good person. And the thing that I want to talk about is uh, practical security, which is more lessons learned, it's a combination of information security, operational security over time. Things that uh, you'll see when you travel around the world. Like, I literally was in India two days ago. I was like, Mark, I swear I'm coming. Don't, st don't stress. Don't stress. Um, <laughs> and uh, on Friday, I'm flying out to Berlin. Things are so different from the internet connection to the price you pay for data to people's relationship to technology and their thoughts on it, right? In Europe, they have this thing called GDPR, where everyone is like, hey, that's my data. You can't hold on to my data. You got to delete that information. If you use your VPN for VPN users and you put it to your, any European countries, you'll see all these messages like, hey, we use cookies. We're sorry we use cookies. Is that OK with you? You know, like, uh, it's a totally different situation. If you go to a, 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 dating mine, a data mining website like Spokio or Pipple, and you type in a European friend's information, there's a lot less there than what's on us, right? Cool. Um, I'm going to talk about the four types of hackers. 
And I'm trying to make a lot of space so we can do a Q&A. Do people have questions, though? Anyone? No. No questions? Nobody. OK. Maybe no Q&A. Um, <laughs> There are more than four types of hacker. It's a complete generalization. I mean, what is a hacker anyway, right? I mean, does a hacker have to wear a black hoodie? No, you can wear a gold jacket, you can do whatever you want, you know? <laughs> um, I think a hacker is someone who's always curious, who's wondering, yeah, but how exactly does that work? Let me make sure, let me take it apart, and maybe I can't put it back together, but I learned something, right? There were always hackers like there was always technology. Technology was the wheel. Technology was fire. And we come from a tradition of people who had questions about fire, and they had burnt fingertips, right? People who had questions about the wheel, and maybe it crushed their foot, but they were curious, and that's, what, that's our kind of hacker descendants, right? Uh, but I'm talking about the four types of paid hacker in a generalization. And I want to talk about um, my friends who are, or my favorite people who are in those four. Right? And then maybe I'll, I'll loop back if nobody has any questions and, and talk more, because I like talking. How's this, um, how's this keynote going? Awesome. Yeah? Is this what you came for? Making sure. Because there's, B-Sides is really special. B-Sides is, people who you'll see tomorrow at the grocery store. B-Sides is people who you'll see at the next like sci-fi movie waiting in line at the local cinema, right? B-Sides is not flying to Vegas and getting a hotel room and none of that stuff. It's real, it's local, it's where it all starts. It's a real community. And uh, please take the time to not only listen to things like this keynote, which are very different from the technical talks, but also turn to the right and left and be like, hey, what, what brought you here to the person you see in the hallway? Because this is a one-day thing, but it never ends. This is just the, each of these is just the kickoff for that local energy, right? So for me, there's like these four types of hacker. Uh, they're the govies, right? And to me, the govies are awesome. They're people who work for nation states. They work for governments, usually governments whose passports they hold. Uh, yeah, usually. <laughs> uh, there's some exceptions. I don't want to get into that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, so we all know that there are intelligence gathering organizations and law enforcement organizations and security forces in every country. But we probably don't always realize that every one of those has a, a hacker. Even your local police department might have a data analyst whose job it is to just handle that thing. Um, and they get trained, and maybe there's this one box they get to pull out every once in a while to use. Everyone has that hacker. Then there's the kind of InfoSec cyber firm. Some of them are peddling snake oil. It was really weird. Like, I was in the airport, and I never thought this day would happen. I walked into the terminal, and there was a giant billboard for like a, a company that's only like gonna help other businesses protect themselves from hackers. That's where we are right now. That's like the world that we live in. It's pretty amazing and I, I, it just blows my mind every day. Because uh, you know, I was talking to some folks yesterday about when I got started in this, there was no path. And you definitely didn't think you could make money on it. It was just something that you were, did in the dark by yourself because you were curious and weird, right? Right? Am I right? Anyone else out there? Right? Yeah, okay, it's okay. You're with friends, you're with family here. And um, but now it's different. And now I see people walking around like they're military. We're not mercenaries. We're not spies. We're not trained military. We lose things, we spill things, we are geeks, we dress bad. That's who we are. That's who you are. I've met mercenaries. You are not them. You can have, like, yeah, I get it. You can have the patch and the Velcro, and it's not the same. <laughs> Cybercrime is very lucrative. It's so lucrative that it's an, it deserves a quarter of the pie. The skills that we have can be used to make money. 
And whether that's like in the most dignified way where you bump into uh, some kind of bug and instead of reporting it to the organization or company whose software it is, that you report it to a company that collects zero days for a small fee, which is fine. I'm not going to name them. We all know who they are. Um, or whether you're on the hacker black market working in escrow, not knowing who you're working for, giving a little bit of what you found and getting a little bit of pay until both parties put a thumbs up. You know, um, th The amount of money, though, is either so low that it's like, well, why do I, would I do this? It's kind of murky morality. Or so high, you're like, I hope they never find out who I am. I might not be able to spend this. Right? Um, there's hacktivists, people who, nights and weekends, they fight for a cause. They believe in something. Everyone sitting here believes in something. You want to push that forward. What if you used your tech skills to just give it a gentle push? Maybe you're not the most nuanced political scientist in the world. Hey, you know, maybe you see the world as this way or that way, one and zero. But at least you're doing something. And then there's the bucket that I belong in, which is a public interest civil society hacker. And I feel like that's a group that doesn't get enough attention. That's a group that a lot of people don't realize. Like, how do I get involved there? How do I get funding there? How do I get paid there? What's that look like, right? Um, it's not all, like, ACLU is only so many positions. EFF is mostly lawyers, right? I mean, Cooper is awesome. Eva are awesome. Like, there's, there's hackers under the hood, yeah? But uh, there's other opportunities. Okay. Uh, so one opportunity, this is not like a paid opportunity yet, but it's a new thing that just started, is there's a hacker named Nex, real name Claudio, who works for Amnesty International, and who makes a lot of interesting tools. If you are interested in reverse engineering or malware, uh, you'll see that some of Claudio's tools are, are trying to make it push button to find basic abnormalities, to find indicators of compromise, uh, like Cuckoo and other things like that. So at a um, Chaos Computer Club, I think it was two years ago, uh, I feel like I hear music. OK, but it's cool. At Chaos Computer Club, um, Next decided to launch this thing, Security Without Borders. Because there's Doctors Without Borders, and there's Reporters Without Borders. But there's not really this idea of Security Without Borders. When we read about a hack that's uh, affecting people, for example, just recently, there was this um, discovery by a group called Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto that citizens of Ethiopia were being surveilled, but not in Ethiopia. They live in New York. They live in London. They're being surveilled by their country where they sat, which is very strange and should never happen. But when these things happen and we read about these reports, it doesn't mean that the affected communities are getting the aid that they need because there aren't enough of us to do that. The ratio would be like drinking out of a fire hose. Security without borders is an attempt to say, no matter what your level of skill, we're going to get you in a position where you can donate a few hours or a few days or a few weeks and assist a community in need. And I think it's really admirable and it's a really nice one, so please look into it. This is Emily. Uh, Emily was really awesome, and actually at my last Crypto Harlem event, Emily spoke to the people, which is great. And Emily's a former... Um, NSA hacker, I'll say, right? And um, but Emily was like, I, I'm concerned about this like growing aggression, right? Uh, intolerance and hate groups. And so um, Emily created a thing called Nemesis, which was the first of like maybe I should learn how to do this. I don't know anything about object recognition. I don't know anything about uh, teaching a computer machine learning and having it be able to identify objects. And um, I decided not to put up a picture of Nemesis identifying uh, a symbol of hate. I decided I'll just put a picture of Donald Trump because it, and it's identified as a plate of lasagna, 91%. <laughs> it's just probably like an early test. It's, it's amazingly accurate. It's so accurate that you can run this tool Nemesis. <laughs> That is not a plate of lasagna. Uh, you can you could run this tool Nemesis on a video, and if you run it on a video, it'll show you everywhere there's a symbol of hate even hiding in that video. 
which I think is an amazing project. So, you know, I, one thing that I think is awesome out of the many awesome things about Emily is even though Emily came from the intelligence community, Emily was like, look, I identify with certain movements, certain causes, I have solidarity and I have a certain passion, I'm a human being, and I'm going to spend some time just attempting to do something that Facebook doesn't do, that Twitter doesn't do, and she did it. Like, one human being created a tool that would allow you to just block every troll and every horrible person on the internet, and you wonder why social media companies haven't built something like this, especially now because it's open source and on the web, and you can look at it. So if you're interested in this, definitely check out the code base, okay? Uh, Andre is um, a former FBI agent. He also spoke at Crypto Harlem. I like to try to make sure the govies get a voice there, because honestly, uh, you know, at the speaker's dinner yesterday, sorry we didn't invite you, there wasn't that much food. <laughs> um, at the speaker's dinner yesterday, we talked about how in the media and in, in on TV, hackers are one of these four things and we're fighting against each other. But in reality, we're like 80% the same. Like we listen to the same silly music, we will like the same silly TV and movies, and the other like 20% we don't talk about, right? So, and, um, and Andre spoke about the FBI before there was a, a division that was set up just for hacking and for finding bad hackers or people who were, you know, law enforcement were going after. And Andre um, now works in the private security world. Another example of someone who started in intelligence community and now works in private security. And if you're a fan of Mr. Robot, Andre is the person that makes sure all the FBI stuff is legit. Because we all know the hacking is legit because we understand some of that. But maybe you don't know because you're not an FBI agent that the FBI stuff is legit. And they even have a character that's fake Andre who's this character you might have seen in the, in the last season. Yeah, as a kind of like, hey, haha, you know. Uh, I think his, his name is Andre, too. It kind of looks like Andre in there. Um, okay, and moving on. But again, govy person moving to commercial is a path that you see all the time. But you don't have to start as the govy person to get there. In fact, a lot of times people will think, you know what, I should have just went commercial. I just didn't realize that's a path. Uh, if you self-identify as a woman, there is one of the best reverse engineering malware courses available in the world, and it's free. All you have to do is get to it. And it's called Black Hoodies. And um, Black Hoodie underscore RE is uh, Black Hoodie reverse engineering. And Black Hoodie was the idea of Marion, who is a malware hunter. And Marion, also known as Pink Flawed on uh, Twitter, was like, I want to see more people who look like me in these rooms when I'm taking trainings. I want to see more people who look like me in these meetings when I'm working on malware. Why aren't there those people? And people would say, well, women aren't interested in this, and there are no women. And so Marion thought, well, I'm a woman, so that can't be true. Let me just try to do this thing where I say, hey, I'm going to be in this room, and if anybody wants to come, We'll do three days of intensive classes after email correspondence training. And tons of people showed up. And tons of people graduated. And it happens every single year. Cool. Um, these are people who are changing things. They're using some of their work experience and some of their identity and who they are to push things forward. Uh, Harlow Holmes works for Freedom of the Press um, Foundation. Freedom of the Press uh, is an organization that works with news organizations, reporters, and journalists. And Edward Snowden has a position at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Eva works as the director of cybersecurity at EFF. Every day, when a reporter needs a training on just how to do simple things like GPG or difficult things like source management, right? Or, um, you know, trying to understand like chain of custody for things that were leaked from a whistleblower, Harlow heeds that call. 
And the nonprofit Freedom of the Press Foundation fronts a lot of that bill. So people can get the care that they need and they publish information. And they have a site now that also looks for abuses of the digital rights of reporters all around the world. And it has a map and you can just kind of check it all out. Eve is a woman on the internet who knows how bad trolling is, but also understands that some of the biggest threats, when you look at a real threat model facing people who self-identify as women, are their partners and ex-partners. And wrote a post on Twitter, if you're a woman and you're getting harassed or having a problem with a hacker, let me know. I will help you. And, huh? All right, OK. It's kind of crazy to just write that in your timeline and then you get thousands of people liking it and all these, how do I get, do you have DMs? Like, what's the best way to do? But she was like, look, I got to start somewhere, right? I might not be able to help every single person, but I definitely help the first five, 10, 15, 20, right? What if we all just said, I'll help one of you? So many people were like, I need help. And it was really funny because some of the posts afterwards were like, wow, like these hackers are not good. <laughs> this was easier than I thought, you know. Uh, Bruna is a friend of mine who used to work for organizations like GJS, um, who took hostile environment training, understands physical security the way I do, which is like from sitting waiting for my turn to do my digital side. But now works in a new position that's going to be in every newsroom in the world. And that's leading digital security and information security for a news organization. In her case, it's the New York Times. If you care about news and fake news, you care about media and how the stories are told, they need you. There's an application security position open right now at the New York Times. You can go from studying here or attending B-Sides to working there. Micah works for a smaller news organization called The Intercept. They're like a website only. Right? Cool. I was hanging out with Micah the other day. He was smiling, he was hanging, you know, throwing back a drink, giving me a high five. It's like, you'd think he has no worries in the world, but he's the person that defends the Snowden archive. Regardless of how you feel about the fact that those documents exist, he's the person who decides what gets locked down and how. So when they slowly release them, it's not um, spilled all over the place. right? And so the list of adversaries and people who are interested in seeing those documents before they get published is, as you can imagine, rather high. But these are the challenges that are really exciting because there's no path easily laid down. You're not sitting there at work following a checklist that was made from uh, a consulting firm. You know, a lot of times a group will hire you not for your intellect and skill, but because you can never get this checklist wrong. But that can get pretty boring after a while. Imagine playing a game that there are no rules and there's no clear path forward. On the hacktivist side and on the cybercrime side, I asked a bunch of my friends, like, who wants to be in the slide? Really strange. Everybody stepped away. They were like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, so I, I, had to, I had to go with people who, you know, have already had their moment, right? Uh, Tiflo, Mustafa, used to work for LulzSec. And uh, I think he was 16 years old at that time. And at one moment, they were the baddest hacktivist crew on the known internet. They would point out a target, and they, whatever they said they were going to do got done. But then we all know, you know, the whole, like, Sabu story. Okay. So, um, but now Mustafa is an amazing researcher. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it was just in December I was watching him speak about his work noticing how... British spies uh, work on the internet to uh, 
you know, discover information. It's a really amazing video if you go to media.ccc.de, okay? Media, like video, audio, media, dot three Cs, Chaos Computer Club, dot DE, as in Deutschland, and um, just type in Mustafa Al-Bassam, and you'll, you'll see this great, great video. You're probably watching it right now. Headphones, please. Um, John Threat, a.k.a. Corrupt, you know, one thing you'll notice is when, you, when you're done with your hacktivist career, which usually doesn't end well, or you're done with your cybercrime career, uh, like, you know, Secret Service was like, Corrupt, please stop jumping into phone calls and phone lines. And uh, he was like, maybe, right? So then they were like, one year in federal prison. But uh, after that, uh, he became John Threat, the filmmaker. Um, and uh, also someone who is, I, was a hero of mine when I was a kid. You know, I, I picked up this Wired magazine, and there was a guy who looked like me on the cover, and I'd never seen anything like that before. And I found out that he was doing exactly what I was doing, but to this, like, really insane high level, high stakes. And uh, John is someone who's still very passionate about this work, but now on the legal side, or, you know, not so illegal side. Uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis wrote a book, Queer Privacy. Sarah used to work for GCHQ, which is kind of like the NSA in, in England, right? Um, but now works on things that Sarah's really passionate about, which are um, how threats are different for different people, how the queer community has issues with um, privacy and how that is, um, spills into the digital side of things. When your very identity is a thing that is most um, under threat, the digital side of that is quite important. Also, Sarah does work on um, securing modern toys that have intelligence and Bluetooth and all kinds of crazy things for parents, and also personal pleasure devices, which are now getting really high tech but with very, very bad application and digital security. But you probably don't want that thing near your body. So um, <laughs> just because, like, it's weird, because um, this is something that like, was like, well, I use these things. I want to look into it. I have curiosity. And I'm going to write papers and blog posts to make a difference. It touches my identity. It touches my community. And I'm going to make a difference. And from that, you're going to get calls, you're going to find consulting work, you're going to have articles written about you. That's a path that you can take. Kirsten is a woman who was a single mom, was working a computer job, heard about, like, I want to get into this infosec thing, was dealing with a tough boss who was treating her not the same as all the other employees because she was a woman. So she wrote this book, Secure the Infosec Bag, um, now is doing great, uh, works on in industrial control systems and sec securing them in one of the states in this country. Um, and um, this book is new, and it's kind of like there's no path. There's read this, get this cert, follow this, but it's not laid out in any kind of procedural way. And that's what this book is. It's kind of like a checklist for people who get a job, and are wondering, how can I get better? They get a job and they wonder, how can I succeed? And uh, her goal is to make that all the bug bounties on Hacker One are claimed by women. I think it's an admirable goal. Quiescence is the cyber officer for New York City. Quiescence is super young and is in charge of securing New York City on the cyber front uh, as a CISO for New York City. There, it's like a new position. Every city is going to get a CISO. They don't know where to turn. Quiescence has so many certs, like my head spins. It's like looking at the alphabet 300 times, right? <laughs> if you follow that path, you'll be the CISO of Rochester or any city you want, right? Because it's a burgeoning field. It's a new thing that's happening. The federal government, local and, and national, 
need you to secure cities, villages, states. And um, Parissa is someone I'm just going to talk about is there was a conference, RSA conference, which is sponsor, RSA is a con uh, sponsor of this. And um, Parissa started her own conference called Our SA Conference, which is kind of like a, you know, jokey, right? um, which is very inclusive and very diverse. Because she didn't see the conference that she wanted, so she made it in a very short period of time, I think a matter of weeks. And it's a real thing. So, sold out in hours. Yeah, sold out in hours, yes. Um, so, um, and people were just continued to buy tickets just to support it, right? People were like, no, no, it's okay, take my money, right? We have that power because our community looks like so many different shapes and sizes, but cares about the same thing. Masashi is someone who works at Citizen Lab. Citizen Lab is um, something that's out of the University of Toronto and is new, but I know that there are things like it happening in Berkeley now, and more tech hubs are developing these kind of centers of um, kind of like cyber excellence. At Citizen Lab, they track how nation states use malware and surveillance against citizens. One quick story, in Mexico, a place where I've done trainings and work with folks, there were a bunch of activists who were getting the same strange text message. Click on this link. Sometimes it would say things like, your daughter was in a car accident, this is a link to the hospital, things like that, right? And most, uh, there's a group called Access Now that many in the audience might not be familiar with, but they have a helpline, which is an encrypted email line. You send them an encrypted email, it's open to anyone who calls himself an activist, right? And they will send you a reply. And they were getting all these emails from people who were not connected and did not know each other with the same basic message. They knew it had to be a threat. It's like the most obvious indicator of any kind of compromise, the most obvious sign that this is a, some kind of a sophisticated attack. They pushed it up to Citizen Lab, who analyzed it, and found that this was a link to a zero day that affected all iPhones and allowed the person on the other end and the command and control center to have access to your phone, your messages. They owned your entire thing. They reached out to Apple, it was patched, and it stopped working, right? Citizen Lab is really small. Citizen Lab has very few people working there. And they're always moving into other parts of this community. They need new people and the other organizations like Citizen Lab also need new people, like this group in Berkeley. Um, Calix Institute, whose shirt I'm rocking, uh, was founded by Nick Merrill. And um, Nick is an awesome person because he had an ISP, and they received a letter, and it said, hey, we need information on one of your users, IP address, etc." He'd never seen anything like it before. He gave it to his lawyer, said, don't tell anyone that you got this thing. He's like, is this real? And the lawyer's like, I've never seen this before, but it, these are real seals. This is really from the government. So it's the FBI subpoena. And it's the first time anyone ever fought a national security letter. It's the only reason why we know national security letters are a thing. Previously, the people who we give our data to were just, okay, yeah, I guess you can have it. Um, and he won. And Calix was like a very, very small operation. Calix now is uh, an institute that assist in education and in learning, and also sponsors my event, Crypto Harlem. That's why I'm rocking this shirt, right? Um, and Nick is someone who needs people to work with him. And other groups like Calix need people who are talented like you. He's a cool person to work for, yeah? Bagels, coffee, <laughs> low hours, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in how to get started on this path, I, I want to let you know that I'm not just like randomly pulling out some faces on Twitter. Like these are people who I talk to quite regularly and refer to and work within the field all the time. Um, there's this book that you probably have not read, but it's awesome. It just came out and it's called Ties That Bind, Organizational Security for Civil Society. Uh, make sure that when you find this thing, Ties That Bind, it's written by the engine room. 
All right? Okay. 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 No worries. Not like a, you know, boating knots type of thing. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ford Foundation paid for an in-depth study into how civil society, the people who are trying to make this world a little less sucky, um, how they help, how they work, how nonprofits deal with organizational security. And it's something that we need to understand because um, it's not something that's taught, and it's information that we can directly apply to assisting and finding jobs and roles in those organizations. There's this thing called a public interest technologist that's well-funded with grants and funding to the millions of dollars. So you don't have to sleep on your friend's basement, um, basement floor or couch or something like that. You can actually do this as a real job in something that's different from working in intelligence uh, or different from working in academia. There's another book, um, Holistic Security, a strategy manual for human rights defenders. Uh, Holistic Security is like 180 something pages and it's published by Tactical Tech. Uh, there's a book out there called something like Holistic Digital uh, Security, but that's not this. It's Holistic Security um, by Tactical Tech. Both these books are free, by the way. You could just go to the websites or find them on the, um, on the internet and get their PDFs. Mm -hmm. Another resource that I use all the time when I'm doing risk assessments, when I'm um, kind of doing my decision matrix on you know, trying to be objective, deciding whether it's safe to go somewhere or how I can help someone because I need to understand exactly what it's like sitting where they are before I go sit with them is this group Frontline Defenders, which publishes this thing called the Annual Report on Human Rights Defenders at Risk in 2017. Frontline Defenders does a lot of work on the digital space. And if you go to their website and you type in a country, you'll find someone who um, is in a country or is in a city or is in a place where their government came after them because of something they did, like a USB or an email or things like that. Right? Um, they're an amazing organization, and this guide or this annual report is uh, and must read. Cool. Uh, let's see how much time I have. I'm over time, I think, right? Yeah, Keep okay. Going. Okay, five minutes. Okay, so um, I was going to talk about some of my experiences in the field. So let's do this really quick. Uh, in my five minutes, would you rather a Q&A type thing? You could clap, Q&A. You could vote twice. Anybody? No? Q&A, nobody, one person, one question. Okay, I'll talk to you afterwards. Cool. Yeah, and thank you for asking a question. I'll find something to give you. Maybe this jacket. Uh, <laughs> all right, so I asked some people I work with uh, because I work in private commercial security. Um, it's different from some of these great nonprofits like Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, our clients prefer um, discretion, right? Whether I can get in depth about some stories. So I decided, like we talked about in this is the version of the story I'm going to tell. Right? Um, I was in a country, and the people there were getting hacked constantly. Their phones were getting hacked. Um, their emails were getting hacked. And it ends up that in that country, everyone uses Yahoo as their email provider. What you'll find when you travel right, is uh, the world is so different by just moving a few miles or kilometers in a different direction. Some countries, everyone uses Viber. They're like, WhatsApp, what's that, right? Some countries, everyone uses Yahoo emails, right? You can't tell them, don't use Yahoo emails. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? Your job is to find a way to make this safe. Your job is to meet them where they are and make that moment something that changes the whole trajectory of their movement, of their reporting, of whatever they're doing. I got them off of using, um, uh, I got them onto using 2FA, right? And I was explaining how it works. You put your number in, and then you'll get a text, and then you put this code in. But in the field, to put in your text, your number in, in Yahoo, when you put this country in, it doesn't let you put the right number of digits in. Whoever programmed that field didn't realize, like, they have a different number, and it doesn't work. Uh, I had to, like, go in, inspect it, look at the request that came through and just push in 
uh, a number and it, it took it. So, you know, uh, that's not something that they could do tomorrow, right? That's not something they could do next week to protect themselves. So when I find things like this, you know, I'm just like, hey, you know, you need to fix this. This isn't good. You know, uh, and person always says, well, what do you mean it's not good? And I'm like, well, this doesn't work for this particular country. You look it up the number. And it's a really weird conversation you're going to have. It's kind of like if you've ever had to, um, if you ever found a bug and you were trying to like disclose it responsibly. It's like first there's like these different phases, like they're like really defensive and then they're confused and then they're like really suspicious and then you get them to come around and they still don't fix it. Um, <laughs> but eventually you get it done. And when you get this done, it feels great because you know that you're not just helping the people in that room, you're helping anyone from that country. Uh, when you get this done, it's not like you found a flag in a CTF, which is super exciting. You know that feeling? But you're like, wow, like I'm helping someone live. I'm helping someone um, be free. I'm helping someone maybe avoid being detained or, or tortured. Right? Uh, I was working in an African country where they were not very evolved on gay rights. They're not very evolved on the rights of queer folks, gender nonconforming folks, right? And um, I had to work with a room of people from different countries, right? Africa is not, it's a continent, it's not one country. And every country has different laws. And I found like when researching these laws, they were like basically copying and pasting parts of European laws and slapping them together and being like, this is our law, right? Um, but in that, they were creating like, okay, it looks like this thing that I want you to use, you can't go home and use that. If you get caught with this Tails USB, if you get caught with this uh, Veracrypt uh, hidden volume, it could be over for you. So in that, you know, you, you can't follow the best practice that you read about on the internet or when you see people arguing on Hacker News or Stack Overflow or whatever, right? You need to really dig deep and ask yourself, like, am I okay with sending this person off with advice that can get them in serious trouble? You have to be very prescriptive. And it requires some understanding of law, some nuance, some understanding of physical world. And um, we ended up coming up with a, a solution that didn't use computers at all, right? <laughs> you know, so it was just kind of like, you're going to go to this place, you're going to blow a whistle, People will hear it, <laughs> you know. Um, those those are those are the kinds of um, solutions you you find yourself having to find, right? Uh, we don't always win. Sorry, I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna try to wrap up. Two minutes, thank you. Uh, there was recently a training in Turkey with people who do the same work that I do. We're working to a local division of Amnesty and some other groups, so just getting some students together and talking about. <laughs> digital safety. But unfortunately, through a like, perfect storm of bad coincidences and events, that training, the doors blew open from the back door. Security forces came in and arrested everyone, the locals and the trainers, who were put into prison. And we had to campaign to get them out. You know, um, It's not the safest job in the world. Right? It's not the easiest job in the world, but it's probably one of the most fulfilling, I feel, working in the field, shaking hands with someone who really is like a hero in your eyes. Um, sometimes I, I do check in always with my students, and sometimes they don't answer me back and I find out like they're on house arrest. They don't answer me back and I found out that they disappeared. And I, I was having this conversation yesterday what do you do when that happens? How do you continue to do this work? And um, I, I, I remember I was saying how, like, you know, you get a good therapist, right, first of all. Right? Um, your students are not risk averse. They're people who are fighting so hard for the liberation of their people, for the like, positioning of their digital rights, to have a real open internet like that we enjoy every day. Uh, for things like this, they're reporters, they're activists, they're fighters. And they know that they're going to get a few. They have to take a few to give a few. And uh, in that, you, I can feel pretty good, because I know that they would be doing this anyway. And I'm doing my best to outfit them with the tools and the skills they need to do it longer, to do it better. And they're appreciative. And every once in a while, there is a win. 
and it just keeps you going. You celebrate that win, and it makes you it makes this job all worth it. So um, sorry to I think like I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, okay, so. OTF, if you have an idea for some cool app or some cool tool, you don't need to go to venture capitalists. You don't need to go to some social good hackathon. You can just look at what OTF has funded, learn about how they work, and consider trying to get together with a group. Maybe you form with your friends and get a contract. Um, Fight for the Future is a way to be a hacktivist without worrying about ending up in prison. You know, they do a lot of great work and are very effective and are very small groups of people. Reach out to them and say, listen, I've got the skills to do some of this good work. Um, NetGind, collection of pool money, that it, civil society, a lot of different groups came together to try to say, let's pool our money because we want to make sure that you get pay that's competitive or pay that's on par for the work that you do and your colleagues who are also leaving, right, do, right? Okay. Uh, Mozilla has an open web program. Mozilla uh, will pay you for a year to travel the world, uh, to work with a nonprofit, and to help them uh, with making the internet healthier. And the applications are open right now, so just apply. I mean, I applied, and it was hundreds and hundreds of applicants. They picked eight of us, and I was lucky. It's like winning the lottery. Just do it. It doesn't, it's a simple web form. Uh, New America Cybersecurity Initiative. If you're a pro out there, you don't, not all the stuff is like entry level, but if you're a pro out there, think about getting a small fellowship with New America, writing a paper, having them support your work, and attending their conferences. Uh, just getting immediately into working with people who are cyber comms or military, uh, different types of voices, and dealing with different types of problems. It really changed the way that I think about a lot of this stuff. Um, Ford Foundation has a tech fellows program, and that's where you'll actually work inside the Ford Foundation, helping them with technology. And it's a, an ongoing uh, fellowship program. for I think it's like a two-year fellowship, uh, and it's it's really amazing. And you'll end up having access to all these different groups and all these different amazing people, right? Uh, okay, cool. Uh, who saw the Mark Zuckerberg? Um, uh, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg comes to uh, the Hill, right? Uh, I know people, uh, a couple of my friends at Tactical Tech were writing really funny posts, like uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, my, my VCR keeps blinking 12 o'clock. Can you fix it? Uh, we need the people who serve us, right? Because we're their constituents to do better, and what better way than to going to Congress and immediately helping someone understand the issues that we know so well. And that's what this uh, Congressional Innovation Fellowship is. It's getting tech folks onto the Hill for uh, about a year, and just look into it. If you think, like, wow, I, I didn't like the way that went down, it's not really their fault. Could you imagine not having someone who properly advised you working with you every day? So why don't we, as good citizens, if you're not going to run for office, why not run for a nerdy office and get in there, right? <laughs> uh, Code for America is a similar program. Uh, they deal with programming and developing, but security and application security is becoming more a part of this. And you'll get a stipend, and you can work in different places, and there's a lot of positions open. Just sorry, I put it out there. Uh, there are organizations like Hewlett Foundation, which do a lot of work in security, have fellowships and openings that, again, are accessible to people who are not, uh, who are experienced out there, or who are hearing my voice, um, and a few things for people who maybe are, are starting out. Okay. Uh, nope. Nope. Uh, Aspiration Tech is a nonprofit that has a nonprofit dev summit where developers work in open source tools to help regular folks and activists are always out there. Uh, sorry to come to your lunch. Uh, Chaos Computer Club, it's not easy to get to, and it's a little overwhelming. But if you go, you'll see me there, so just say what's up. Uh, Republica is a a large media conference, and it happens to be in Germany, but also a place where you'll meet people who are attacking this issue from a different point of view. Not everything comes from San Francisco in um, the world of uh, InfoSec and apps and tools. RightsCon is coming up. It's in Toronto. It's a place where activists and policymakers get together to try to come up with uh, digital rights and security issues. And all these things have job boards, by the way. Also, Freedom Forum is something from the um, Human Rights Foundation who I work with. And you'll, you know, when you go to the forum, it's kind of like a TED talk, but for activists and dissidents. Uh, I met someone who was like poisoned several times by the FSB, which is like Russian security forces. Uh, I met someone who is an opposition leader who was like, I know the people surveilling me. They, I bring them tea in the morning. They sit outside in the car, right? Uh, you'll get to meet great, amazing people like this, but you also get to help them and talk to them about uh, InfoSec. So um, I know that this is something that's, they have like a little kind of genius bar, tech bar every year, 
and it's really in, they need more people there to, to help these folks. It's really amazing. Okay. Um, Allied Media Conference is an American conference for American activists, and it's their 20th anniversary, and it's in Detroit every year. So you can think about you know just going there. It's really really young. Um, it's it's really really exciting. Um, and tech and, and hackers and infosec folks are always needed by these growing movements in our own country. ThoughtWorks is a commercial company that tends to be kind of progressive and allow people to do passion projects. Uh, and okay, that's it. Sorry, that's the earth. <laughs> do a good job, protect it. That's my slides. Sorry about that. Okay. Please eat some food. The food truck line is not for the meek. Sorry I ran over, man. No, no. I hope that was, hope that was a good one. Yeah. 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 This is a, like an official speaker badge. Whoa. Whoa, I made it.